Okay, we're back. We're live. It's a five o'clock block, and uh, I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and we're doing Community Matters about Hank uh, Stackpole, who uh, was a Lieutenant General in the Marine Corps and who died uh, 10 days ago or so, and the community in the military and local community is mourning him. Yeah. Uh, and and um, okay, we're, and both gentlemen knew him, knew Hank Stackpole, um, and both gentlemen had, what do I say, a connection in the service and out of the service with him, part of a part of the uh, the flag officer group, may I say? Uh, so, can we talk about his life and times, uh, Tom? Can you give us your impression of how his career was going for him? Well, let me say first off, uh, you know, Hank's uh, death is a tremendous loss to the community. Uh, I mean, he impacted Hawaii in in so many many ways. Uh, you know, I first started to work with him in 1999 when I came out here and took command of the Pacific Fleet. And of course, Hank was the, the very first uh, director of the Asian Pacific Center. And uh, he came in, stood it up, uh, made it uh, the key part of our outreach uh, throughout the Pacific Command. Uh, and that was just uh, uh, one chapter of a fabulous career as a, as a Marine who uh, served in Vietnam, uh, who uh, obviously was injured very seriously in, uh, in Vietnam, uh, who rose to the ranks to command uh, all of the Marines in the Pacific, had a very distinguished career in the, in the private sector uh, for a number of years, uh, and then of course ran the Asian Pacific Center. And, and after he retired uh, from the Asian Pacific Center, I think it was in, in 2004 or so, he, uh, he continued to contribute to the Boy Scouts, to the Armed Services YMCA. Everywhere you look, you could find Hank Stackpole's fingerprints on this community. Yeah, and although he although he um, he left uh, you know the chief executive position um, at APCSS, he stayed with the APCSS, the Daniel K. Inouye, uh Foundation uh, that surrounded that. I think he stayed in that for some time. Um, but he, he was instrumental in developing the whole system, wasn't he, at APCSS? He, um, he brought people together in a kind of a diplomatic way from various places in Asia. Um, it, was like a, it was like a super east-west center uh, for executives, for military, and he, he put them together in condo rooms in Waikiki. They had to live together, even though they were from different countries that may not have been all that friendly. And then they got friendly personally, with the notion that when they went home again, they could pick up the phone and call their roommate. And uh, I met some of them, I, I interviewed a number yeah. of them. And, and well, uh, that was all his idea. That was the way he was setting this up and it worked really well. Well, the, the mission of the Asian Pacific Center is to deal with a part of the uh, civil military relationship within the national security establishment. So. As you know, the Pacific Command and all the components, uh, the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, go out and exercise and train with their counterparts throughout the Pacific. But you know, those are more traditional warfighting constructs. Uh, the Asian Pacific Center filled uh, a real gap, and that is, you know, how do uh, members of the military uh, throughout the Pacific, whether they're from Indonesia. Pakistan, the Philippines, Japan, Korea, how do they relate uh, to their governments? And of course, uh, as you know, we believe in civilian control of the military. Well, this allowed uh, those senior officers to come in and understand how key institutions of government work. You know, the rule of law, for example, uh, how does the military uh, interact with their respective communities, uh, all of the things that make uh, the military uh, a key and supportive element of uh, their interagency, the, the different government bodies uh, uh, within their countries. And uh, so Hank, Hank understood this, uh, you know, from uh, to soup to nuts. But the way you make that work is you have to bring these officers from all over uh, Asia and the Pacific together. And as you pointed out, uh, some, like the Indians and the Pakistanis, may not have always had uh, great relationships, uh, but the Asian Pacific Center uh, brought them together, 
to understand these key aspects of government and to build relationships among themselves going forward. It was a perfect job for him, wasn't it? He was so well suited. Um, you know, General Gardner was telling me about his uh, job as a as a PAO back out of uh, Princeton, was it, as a lieutenant? Yeah. And, yeah uh, so uh, he, he did uh, develop the right uh, background for where he ended up uh, as a you know he was an English major, graduated out of Princeton, initially assigned to uh, you know as a second lieutenant, he was a platoon commander for a combat engineer platoon. And his first job right after that is, uh, was as the public affairs officer in Camp Lejeune. And I cannot imagine uh, uh, General Stackpole getting those orders. This is the orders that every, uh, any uh, hard driving infantry officer dreads being a public affairs officer, Camp Lejeune. And, and, and from there, though, he was assigned as a PAO to uh, Iwakuni, uh, Marine Corps Air Station Iwakuni, where he worked for the Far East Network which was the uh, Armed Forces Network um, at that time in there. And I think that's where, and that was his first of four uh, separate uh, tours in Japan. And uh, already here as a first lieutenant, obviously an articulate individual as an English major out of Princeton, he's uh, interacting with the community. And um, we know how fraught the relations are between uh, the US military and, and, uh, and, and um, Japanese and the Okinawans, uh, and uh, in this case, he started out at this young age, and it just carried through his career. And he, he, um, you know, the leadership is obvious. He commanded a unit at every grade, every rank he had in the Marine Corps: second lieutenant, first lieutenant, and he was a company commander uh, as a captain in Vietnam uh, in '66, '67, and that's where he received this uh, this grievous injury with a 50 caliber round to the leg and um, then survived a, a crash of the medevac helicopter and was actually triaged as, um, you know, permanent routine or not, not necessarily, uh, was not going to get the priority of the doctors. And it's his, his chaplain, who is another story in itself, Chaplain uh, Vic Krulak, um, who's the son of one of the most famous Marines, Brute Krulak, who had been commander here, um, uh, then, you know, pushed hard with the surgeons to change his triage status, and treat him, uh, and then, um, and, and of course, he survived and was assigned uh, and went back to um, D.C. area to recoup. Um, and once again, even in this uh, re recoup period, in the late um, 60s, he went and got a master's degree in political science in his off time at GW University and was then assigned to command the, uh, uh, the Marine portion of the NROTC unit at Stanford, got another master's degree. And of course, he is setting himself up, as you can just see, now we're in the, um, in the 70s and the 80s, and he's getting this background of developing and going back and forth into various jobs in the Marine Corps coming on. I had the honor of working for him uh, in uh, 1986 and 87 in one of his, in his, um, I think his third or fourth tour in uh, Japan. Uh, he was a one star, he was 15 years my senior. I of course served for 37 years. He was 15 years my senior, I was a young major and um, um, learned a lot from General Stackpole from his very courtly, uh, uh, gentlemanly manner and, uh, but a very tough, Tough, uh, tough master. Well, the Marine Corps uh, in, the, in the days, the formative days there was the, the Marine Corps under Chesty Puller, um, who was a tough commandant, wasn't he? And he, he was um, um, kind of a, a symbol of it in those days, in the days of Vietnam. Um, I remember hearing about that when I was in the service. And the well, Marine, Marine birthday ball was really special. Yeah, it still is. And it's an around the world event. And uh, we're, we're proud of that, of course. Um, and, you know, of course, Chesty Puller uh, was actually stationed here in Hawaii in 1950 when he, as a colonel, uh, lived over at Pearl Harbor. I had the privilege of living in his house. Is that right? Uh, he was called away to Korea and then, uh, um, you know, was, had been very famous in World War II. And then also went, when he was called away to Korea, he was called away from his house here in Pearl Harbor. And um, then, you know, uh, led the Marines and chose some reservoir, et cetera. Wow. The, uh, but that predates General uh, Stackpole a bit. 
and the um, uh, and General Sackville had a reputation in the Marine Corps of being this uh, very stern um, and um, thoughtful, extremely articulate uh, leader, um, and um, of course, very erudite. I felt that the, the moment I met him, I, I had him on a radio show 15 years ago. And when it was over, he, he stood up to leave and he said he had to go. And I said, it's okay, I'll follow you anywhere. And, that, and, that, and that's the kind of guy I thought he was. So, Tom, you know, he worked for you. He was the, the, the head of the Marine Corps for the, for the Pacific under your command, right? No, he, he actually preceded uh, my time uh, as the Pacific commander. Uh, he, uh, he worked for me as the, as the head, uh, the president of APCSS, because at that point in time, APCSS uh, reported to the Pacific Command. It, you know, I want to go back to something Emo mentioned, and, and that was that, uh, that Hank got a second degree at Stanford. You know, we sent uh, Hank Stackpole to Stanford uh, right at the toughest period of time during the Vietnam War, you know, the, the early 70s. And we've talked about how articulate he was and, and his diplomatic skills. Uh, no job in the world could yeah. challenge you more right. Right. than that particular period of time because you can remember what the unrest was like yeah. on on U.S. campuses and and he went in there. He actually had command of the ROTC unit, and he uh, he had the the really uh, unenviable job of to try to explain to faculty and students alike, you know, the non-military students as to to why serving your country was important, uh, why what we were doing in Vietnam was important to our national security, and, and why they had a value. Uh, these these uh, uh, Marines and uh, Naval officers or future Marines and Naval officers in this ROTC unit, because uh, it was a tough period of time. And, uh, you know, the Marines are, uh, and midshipmen are walking around with uh, hair that looks like yours and mine right now, Jay. They had short haircuts, <laughs> and everybody else had hair down to their, their shoulders. And so they. I was away. So I was in an ROTC, an ROTC unit during this period at Duke, not at Stanford, and uh, I had short hair. But we we did not. Uh, we could only wear our uniforms like a half a day a week or something. And uh, but you're absolutely dead on. This was the period of Kent State. Um, you know, pepper gas on the campuses, um, really tough time. And uh, the leaders, um, I mean, you're right, dead on about the leadership. And he was, he was very effective. I mean, uh, if you've ever spent any time with, with Hank, uh, uh, he's hugely persuasive. I mean, he, uh, and he, he does it in a manner, uh, you know, without uh, offending or, challenging a person's ego uh, as he is uh, as he is uh, reinforcing the the key points of of his argument and he can listen and he he listened very effectively too which was a, a skill you certainly needed during this period of time and you know i was was looking back at his record they gave him a legion of merit as a uh, professor of naval science at an nrotc unit and and I don't think I've ever seen it before, but it was it was in recognition of just how difficult a task yeah. and how effective he was uh, in uh, you know a, a troubled period of time for our nation. Well, he got a lot of awards. Of course, he got the Purple Heart. He got uh, something from Silver Star. He's Silver Star, Silver Star. Um, the third highest uh, award for uh, you know. Uh, he got he got two awards um, in um, um, in in Asia from Asian governments from the Japanese government, and there was a second one also. So I mean he's been a, around. He he um, he he'd done uh, statesmanlike things, uh, and he'd made friends uh, among people in foreign in foreign service, um, and the result was you know. I perceive that, and you and you gentlemen will both have seen this happen, sometime probably after Vietnam, uh, the American military became statesmen. Uh, their mission changed, and they were, uh, they were part of soft power, smart power. 
they were connecting on a diplomatic level. Am I right about that? Yeah, I, I think so. And and of course, Hank participated uh, in one of the very significant soft power efforts of of, uh, of our time. And, and that was, remember the flooding in Bangladesh? Bangladesh. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah, Bangladesh. Flooding in Bangladesh, which really uh, tremendously uh, devastated that country. And and they put together Operation Sea Angel, which uh, was essentially a, a maritime operation to provide humanitarian assistance to to that country. And and, and I'm sure that was, uh, uh, that made a mark on him in terms of uh, when he became president of APCSS, you know, how do we, how do we teach those soft skills also, as well as uh, the military skills? You know, how do you, how do you help uh, your, your fellow man, whether uh, it's in a, a flood like that, uh, uh, an earthquake in other countries, uh, the tsunami situations we've seen in Southeast Asia, and how the military, uh, and not just as a, in a part of a single country, but as a, as a multilateral force uh, can uh, bring their capability together uh, in a disaster relief or humanitarian effort. Well, that kind of well, smart yeah. power inures to the benefit of the country for sure. Uh, and the other medal I was uh, I was referring to is the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. So he he had friends there too. And he had done good things there. So it's a statement. I'm sorry, Ima, please. No, I was just going to say the, uh, the, the Sea Angel operation actually set the pattern for even how those sort of relief operations are done today uh, in the area. He was a joint task force commander, uh, went forward with a very small headquarters to figure out what had to be done, had different kinds of assets here and there, special operations people and Air Force and bringing those all together and dealing locally with the, uh, the population. I think it was like 140,000 dead. It was a, um, typhoon, a cyclone, I guess they call them there. And the, um, you know, a predecessor of what we've seen with the tsunami and uh, sort of almost routine disasters here in the Western Pacific. But you so you both, sorry. I was gonna say that, that kind of background, Jay, uh, allowed him essentially to write the curriculum for the Asian Center. Because you know he he goes in with a clean sheet of paper, and he has to he has to figure out you know how are we going to uh, put a faculty together and put a curriculum together that will make a difference in uh, the ability of these countries to support essentially democracy throughout Asia and the Pacific and. And a lot of these uh, countries, uh, the democratic instincts at the start, you know, weren't as as well formed. Uh, certainly not as well formed as they were after Hank spent six years there, uh, teaching in the way a military operates uh, properly within, uh, you know, a liberal democracy. Well, you know, there have been uh, emerging liberal democracies in Asia in that same period. And I believe this was a really good um, diplomatic move to establish APCSS. It was uh, Dan Inouye, wasn't it? He was behind it or uh, supporting it anyway, right? Yeah, it was very much Dan Inouye. And, you know, he, we picked that land down there in Fort Derussi. You know, that, it, uh, it sits right where the old uh, club used to be when I was, uh, I think, a junior in high school down there at Fort Derussi. And I remember spending many happy hours there with an emphasis on the word happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it, was, it was Dan's vision to put that together. There, were, there was something similar in Europe, you know, the, the Marshall Center that uh, had been established to provide uh, some of the same kind of civil military uh, training, but there hadn't been anything in the, in the Pacific. And, and another reason it was particularly important is that, you know, multilateral institutions in the Pacific, you know, are, are, not, uh, are not like those that had been formed in Europe, like NATO, and uh, where there was a, a very strong tradition of bringing all these countries together and then sitting and collaborating, you know, as one. So, uh, APCSS, the, 
the vision of it from Dan Inouye and the execution of it from Hank Stackpole uh, built a, a lasting and important you know, multilateral institution here uh, in this area of responsibility. Well, definitely an achiever, an achiever in, in the service and out. Um, and, it, you know, you, you fellows have a, like a, a club of flag officers that you must see each other, or at least you remember uh, collaborating with each other during your careers and all that. So this must, this must have um, a significant effect for you to lose him. He was 85, but, you know, you would have hoped to, he would live longer. I mean, how do you feel about it, you admirals and generals people? I mean, 1185? Well, <laughs> it's only around the corner, you know. <laughs> sounds like a, sounds like a, a, a very uh, appropriate uh, point in time to, uh, to meet your maker. I mean, you know, Hank, uh, as we've talked about before, he contributed on, on so many levels, uh, even, even after he left APCSS, and uh, that he was a, uh, he was a force within the community. And, and you know, there aren't a large number of senior retired military officers here. It's surprising, uh, you know, based on the number of folks that come out here and serve in, in active duty. Uh, but it's a, Dan Inouye reminded me of this. It's a relatively small number. And there's, and there's lots of reasons for it because people have families on the mainland. Uh, there aren't a lot of aerospace and defense jobs here. Uh, in Hawaii, and it's a relatively, you know, small community. Uh, so when a, a person like Hank Stackpole makes that kind of commitment, you know, I'm going to live here for the rest of my life. Uh, he's doing it for all the right reasons. Yeah. How do you feel about it, Emo? Well, um, I mean, General Stackpole was active even uh, in the Marine Corps. You know, the Marine Corps, you, you never really you're always a Marine, once a Marine, always a Marine. But we had uh, often had retired general officer convocations, um, executive off sites, we called them. And General Stackpole participated up until just a couple of years ago regularly in those annual events and was up on Marine issues. Of course, he had served a number of years in, uh, in recruit battalion, um, you know, alternating between infantry jobs and sort of um, he had done so many different things in the Marine Corps that his, uh, and once again, uh, his ability to articulate um, and um, get to the heart of it, you know, and always had that little kind of wry smile um, when he would say something sort of made to think, right, sort of sarcastically and um, uh, a great leader. And uh, certainly we miss him and, um, you know, the, the counsel um, that he had, he had provided. Yeah, you know, um, I, I saw in him, we've been playing pictures of him during the show, and I, I saw in him a, a, a Marine, you know, I, I mean, you don't get to look, ordinary people, ordinary mortals don't look that way. Uh, it's something about the parade ground, it's something about the uniform, it's something about the stiff neck and the, and the, and the special character, you know. Uh, how does that compare with the Navy, Admiral? <laughs> well, I would tell you, we... Uh... We love the Marine Corps, and the uh, the Marine Corps does a couple things that uh, the Navy uh, uh, we don't have in our skill set. And one is marching, and the other is handling uh, small arms. They do it really, really well. <laughs> you know, sailors have a lot of great skills too. But you know, the, the Marines the Marines are the, uh, the the first folks in, and and we recognize that uh, uh, we try to to support. Uh, their their maritime efforts and obviously you know back to amphibious warfare and today in terms of expeditionary warfare but it's a it's a partnership and it has been uh, you know for for decades and and Hank understood that you know Hank Hank was part of the, the fleet marine force and and he and uh, he not only enjoyed but he appreciated that particular role so uh, yeah it's a uh, uh, you got a marine here and a and a sailor uh, on your on your video right now, and and we're joined at the hip. <laughs> I know that, <laughs> but you know one thing we've been talking about is uh, is Hank Stackpole's connection with with Hawaii. He made a decision to stay here. He invested himself. Uh, 
you know, it was no small thing to build a school that way uh, with, you know, everybody watching and making sure that um, he had to navigate and negotiate his way around to create that uh, and, and be very, you know, innovative in the process. Um, so he was truly invested. And then he was part of Pacific Forum. He was there. Every time I went down there, you were there too, um, you know, uh, hearing out all the uh, diplomatic people and the military people who showed up at Pacific Forum still do. Um, and so, you know, what, what I wonder about, I'd like to ask you both is, you know, the, when I came here, the military was a huge leg in the stool. Of course, you had tourism, you had agriculture, and you had the military. That was it. I mean, the rest was uh, accessory. Um, and over the years, we've seen all of those things change. Agriculture changed. Tourism got to be a mono economy. The military maybe is not as numerous as they used to be. I really don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, and then you see the passing of Hank Stackpole, the passing of a senior officer, a flag officer who was committed. Um, and, and you're part of it too, both of you. And, and I wonder where that's all going. Is it, you know, we need to reimagine our economy now. We need to see what stools are on, legs are on the stool. Uh, we need to see what the military is going to be like here. Uh, it wasn't too long ago I conducted a program um, downtown about, uh, you know, about what the Navy was doing, what the military was doing in Hawaii and uh, what, what kind of engagement we could have, the business and Navy community. Um, and and uh, there were protesters outside. What is this? They were protesting the military. That's what they were protesting. So a certain amount of resistance and pushback here. And I wonder, you know, somehow Hank, uh, Hank's passing raises the question of what is the future of not only the retired part of the military, but the whole military here. I mean, the United States Navy has been here since 1850. Um, so question, where are we going? And, it, it, you know, does this raise the issue with you? And how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think uh, it a, provides a time to reflect, right? And of course, you know, uh, you've got folks that uh, we've lost Hank Stackpole, but we, we gained Emo Gardner, you know, as a full-time resident. There you go. <laughs> and kind of the next next man up. Uh, we, uh, but, you know, I think the, the military future here is actually uh, very strong. I mean, the, uh, we all know the importance of Asia and the Pacific, the, the preponderance for our national security interests are, are here in this region. Uh, the Pacific Command is a, is a foundation of that. All the component commanders are represented here uh, in Hawaii. Uh, the interactions with our with our allies throughout uh, the region is uh, is very very strong, and I think the community support is uh, is really is really great. I mean, we we all knew uh, when Dan Inouye was here that uh, the support was was rock solid in the Congress. Uh, but, but today, you look at the, the Military Affairs Council. It's as robust as I've ever seen it. Of course, Connie Lau uh, is the chairman right now, and uh, Dave Carey was before, and guys like Mike O'Neill before that. Uh, but the, a number of, uh, of events where we connect the military to the community now is, uh, is increasing as opposed to, to falling off. And, uh, the interaction with the commanders uh, even higher. So I, I think uh, I think the future's bright. I think from a from the standpoint of the their uh, impact on the community and, and the economy, uh, you're not going to see any uh, any loss of importance there uh, whatsoever. And and I think you'll see uh, just as we as we have for years, you'll see military members retire and stay here and make a lasting contribution. I was up at the Pacific Fleet uh, today and on the way out, somebody handed me a, a bio of a Navy captain that's getting ready to retire and would like to stay right here. And so I'll help him out. That's great. That's, that's, that's what you did. I mean, you, you went into business, you served on all these, um, you know, uh, tech corporations, uh, executive and board member and so forth. And now uh, with uh, HEI, um, so you're, you're committed in the same way. And uh, it's great to have you in the community. So what would you add to that, Ima? 
Well, the national defense strategy orients uh, our the future um, as we begin to prioritize and probably economize on our military budget. Uh, focus is going to continue to be on the Pacific. Um, and there's a lot of long laid plans. Uh, we're more focused on readiness than ever. So the shipyard is taking on uh, ever more importance, uh, and um, there's you know there's more money going into readiness, which means more. Uh, maintenance periods and shipyards, et cetera. The Marines are, we're reducing our presence uh, on Okinawa itself. First, they're completing the construction of bases in Guam and they're gonna move 4,700 Marines from Okinawa to Guam. And when that's complete, there'll be another, probably about 2,500 Marines coming to Hawaii. But the, the overall intent is to reduce uh, Okinawa by 10,000 Marines. Currently somewhere around 20,000 there now. So there's no question that um, you know we're in the, the center of the of action of the future, regardless of what happens overall. Um, the Pacific region's got to become a priority area, and Hawaii is uh, um, is is our you know our forward outpost out here. Yeah, and there will be action. I mean, it's huge and it's growing and changing, and and sometimes it's controversial. And uh, we really have to have a military presence all through the Pacific. Never more true than now, don't you think? Uh, yeah, here's a, a, a memoriam that uh, came in, a testimonial that came in during the show from Stan Osterman, he's a general in the uh, Air National Guard. Um, I met General Stackpole at APCSS. I didn't know him very well, um, but every time I talked to him, my respect uh, for him grew stronger. It was an exceptional, he was an exceptional leader, a model Marine and a gift to Hawaii and any of the world he touched. We lost a real treasure when we lost him, Stan Osserman. Uh, well, uh, uh, Admiral, do you have any words you wanna leave with the public about the passing of Hank Stackpole? I mean, it's a time to, um, it's a time to uh, express that, I think. Yeah, I, I think one thing I'd like to say before we sign off here is, uh, is, you know, uh, this day in, in living in Hawaii is a partnership, and uh, his wife Vivian was, uh, is a trooper, uh, remains a, a trooper, and she's played a huge role here in uh, Hawaii also. I mean, I, I've seen her uh, working, you know, nonprofit and volunteer activity for the full 20 years I've been here, and she's been a, she's been a, a tremendous force for good here. In this community, and so, you know, we uh, uh, we provide our condolences to Vivian. Uh, uh, she was a great partner uh, for over over 50 years, and uh, and she'll still be part of this community going forward. I'm sure and, she will. And that's wonderful. Yeah. And Emo, what what, what would your uh, parting words be? What is what would you express about the pa the passing of Hank Stackpole? Well, we've, we've lost a great uh, Marine leader um, who has, but he has created uh, generations of Marine leadership behind him. I actually think I'm, I'm an example of 15 years, his junior, but working for him and his staff. And I, I mean, I, I carried on and, and, um, and I think that that, that, uh, that tradition, um, such an example, right? And I just, you know, I just keep coming back to this word courtly and um, he, he looked like what a, what a Marine should look like. And, uh, and he has, um, you know, he, he's, left a, he's left a great legacy. Well, gentlemen, it's great. I, I mean, I'm left with a burning question about whether I should join the Navy or the Marines. Um, I, maybe I could check in with your recruiting offices. <laughs> well, well, we'll take, uh... We'll take uh, one of each kinds of recruits. You just send their names to us and we'll, uh, we'll sign them up. And, and, and we'll promise them, just like Hank Stackpole, uh, they'll have a tremendously rewarding career. Absolutely. Thank you, Admiral Fargo. Uh, and thank you, uh, Lieutenant General Gardner. Great to have you guys on the program. Wonderful. Thank you, thank thank you, you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Aloha.